Hello and welcome back to our quest for the stable model semantics of logic programs. So in the last part we have seen how we can associate meaning by the set of consequences to a positive logic program and here we now start to look at general logic programs, in our case normal logic programs where we may have negative body literals. So what lessons have we learned from the positive logic programs? So first of all, as mentioned, we can associate the smallest uh, set closed under the positive program. And this would be the meaning, this would be the consequences of the logic program. These are all the atoms we would expect to be satisfied if we post this as a query to the logic program. So what happens actually as well, which is a bit subtle, is that there are actually many sets that are closed uh, under a, a positive logic program. But by associating strictly the smallest set, we eliminate also all others. And we have seen that this makes sense because they all contain some redundant information, information that is not really provable. And that was more or less the second big insight uh, or more or less feature, let's say feature of um, associating the consequences in that way is that every atom that is among the consequences of a positive program also has a proof. And this is actually a pretty, um, well, distinctive feature of the whole approach, also of stable model semantics. Now, just to, just to recall that, so this is the slightly augmented example that we were looking at before. So we have fact A, we have B if A, and we have a rule that says D, D if C. So in this case, actually, there is no reason to, to believe in C or D, at least under closed world reasoning, because C and D are unknown, there is no proof for them. Hence, under closed world reasoning, they are set to false, and we only get A and B because we have a proof for A and we have a proof for B. So proof for B means we can derive B by the, by the second rule here, and then the, the body of the rule is, is uh, justified by the fact A. This is also interesting in, in, in view of the fact that in, in AI, in a, in a larger context, one talks a lot about explanation. Can the AI system explain its conclusions? And here they are. You can actually look at these proofs here as very simple explanations. Okay, now that... Now, how can we lift all this to the... To, um, arbitrary, that is, normal logic programs, where we also have now negative body laterals? And one way to do that is since we don't have, at least to approach the whole thing, since we don't have a notion of closure that involves negation and all that, perhaps let's look first at a logical perspective. And so instead of looking at the smallest set closed under a program, we look at first at the smallest model. And those of you whom I promised that I will not do too much logic, forgive me, but again, you will, you will get some insight from that. Okay. Now, given that the consequences of a positive program can alternatively be characterized as the smallest model of P, a first trial or a first logical attempt would be to try out whether the smallest model also works for normal logic programs, that is, programs that also have negated, neg negative body literals. So let's test this hypothesis with an example. So here is a very easy example, just a single rule saying A if not B. And I would argue that under two assumptions, first of all, the assumption is that proofs and justifications are formed by taking implication series, implication more or less as the operator that gives us the proofs. So you, we believe in implication and have this as a first class citizen. And I really stress this here now. And second, then applying closed world reasoning gives only one intuitive result uh, on this program, and this is the set that contains A only. Okay, let's, let me explain myself a little bit. So, we have a program that has two propositions, or two atoms, A and B. So, the only rule allows us to derive A, but there is no rule that would allow us to derive B. Again, taking rules serious is more or less part of the argument. Hence, B is undefined, we have no rule that, that would justify it, and now closed world reasoning kicks, kicks in, and closed world reasoning said, oh, if something is undefined, if B is undefined, then it must be false. And hence, we get a model where A is true and B is false. So again, these are the two ingredients, right? So taking implication 
as a first class citizen, not like in classical logic where you can actually map it onto, onto disjunction. Here, implication is a genuine connective that we use for deriving uh, atoms. And then closed world assumption uh, says, well, if something is undefined, if you cannot prove it, then you set it to false. So this also means that, that by proving things, uh, these are all the true, all the true atoms, and the complement then gives you the negative ones, the ones that are false. So this allows us actually to read this rule in a, in a, in a way to say A unless B. So unless there is a proof for B. Because you may later on add B to this and suddenly the rule may not apply anymore. But this again is, I come now in my hand-waving uh, discussion as you already heard in the motivation section where I already talked about closed and open world reasoning. So anyway, this is my argument why it's intuitive and actually the stable model produces, stable model semantics produces exactly this. Okay, now let's look just as, as further exploring our hypothesis. Now we get this A, the model that contains A. What does classical logic provide us with? Can we somehow use the smallest model? So actually classical logic, and keep in mind that classical logic operates under the open world assumption, gives us three models. So actually the model that we have just seen, where A is true and B is false, the model where B is true and A is false, and the model where both A and B are true. Now, how does the open world assumption, or how does open world reasoning, deal with unknown information? Well, B is unknown, hence here the idea is, well, it's unknown, so let's look at the case where it is true, and let's look at the case where it is false. And actually, you, you can see this here with the models. So, the model where A is true and B is false is the case where B is false. And this coincides with our reasoning of closed world reasoning, because closed world reasoning puts unknown information to false. Now the other two models are about the other case that is considered in open world reasoning, where B is true. Now once B is true, not B is false. Hence the prerequisite of this rule here is false, and the rule doesn't impose any constraints. So it, it, it cannot fire, so A can be true, A can be false, and this is also reflected by A being false here and A being true here. Now, if we, okay, this is more or less just to explain what, what happens here. Now, if we do the trick again with looking at the smallest model, and keep in mind it is the smallest model in, in the case of positive problems, there is a unique smallest model. Now, if we look at, the, at these three models, we actually see that there are only two minimal models. There's two models that are minimum, minimal, but incomparable. And actually there is the model where B is true but A is false, but this is somehow not what we would expect under what I was uh, saying before, under closed world reasoning and taking implication serious. So this actually shows that this approach, the quest, our quest somewhat uh, taking this logical attempt and taking the, the, the very simple concept of a smallest model and generalizing this, doesn't work. So we have to be a bit more sophisticated. So then let's perhaps go back and get some intuitions from a procedural approach. And with it again, starting by taking the, taking the closure as a, central, as a central concept. So stay tuned. Now for our procedural attempt, let's first look again how we computed the consequences of a positive logic program and get a bit more space. Pop. Here we go. So this was the procedure with the TP operator that we used to compute uh, the, the closure of a positive logic program. And now we don't have positive programs anymore. Now we have programs with negation in the body, that is with negative body literals. And so what we more or less have to do is here we only test for the positive body literals. We also have to to, to insert a test for the negative body literals. So what do we do here? Here we check whether all positive body literals have been derived are part of X. Now with the negative body literals, we can do something anal analogous. We just test that none of the negative ones are part of X. Again, it's an attempt, right? So we add this condition here, which says, well, again, we look at X and none of the negative body loads of the current rule should be included and this is the condition that tests this. So more or less if both conditions are satisfied, repeating myself, 
if all positive body literals have been derived and none of the negative body literals have been derived, then we fire the rule and add the head to the, uh, to the consequences, to the result of the TP operator. So this is, and then more or less we loop here over the whole thing and we give back the result. Again, in the same way as we had the hypothesis in the logical approach that we use the smallest set as a characterization, let's start with this as a, as a hypothetical start. Okay, so let's test this with an example. So this is more or less the same example we've been using so far, except that I added this condition here to the second rule. So B is now derivable if A is derivable and C is not derivable. Okay, so let's just test this procedure. So as usual, we start with the empty set. So this is more or less here the the trace of, of, of the very first uh, assignment. Then we calculate the consequences with this operator now. And again, let's check this. Well, of course, there are no, there's nothing to be checked here. So both conditions are trivially satisfied, right? So again, here, here we have the empty set. There's, we have here the empty set, and we have here the empty set, and the empty set intersected with the empty set equals the empty set. So this condition is satisfied. Okay, just because, you know, when I say trivial, um, it I don't want to hide things. Things are really easy. And so just to make this explicit now, and now I zip it. Okay, and the second rule, well, we, have, we don't have A inside, so we can't apply the rule. We don't even have to bother about not C, so we conclude A. Okay, well, now second iteration, we, our X has been set to A. Again, we add, we add of course, A, A to the result, and now we have A as a... As a as, as an element of x, we can satisfy the positive condition, that is this condition here. So a is a subset of, of, of a. So once the conclusions and once the positive body literal, I think I'm making too much noise about that. And, but, and also c is not a part of this, hence taking the negative atom. So the negative body, these are the negative we take the negative body literals and strip the negation symbol. So this set here contains C, that is the atom C. We only take the atoms that occur in the negative body literals. So we, the set with C, we intersect with the set with A, and this gives us the empty set, since this condition is satisfied. And as we see, right, C is not a part of, C is not a part of X1. Again, a lot of noise, zip it, and we get as a conclusion A and B, both rules apply. Good, so then we start a, a and b is our is our next value of x. We have it, we apply the operator. Again, the fact is always obtained, so we get, uh, we get a in the result here, and we have a inside, we don't have c inside, so we get b again, and we get the same result as before. So the input equals the output, hence this is a fixed point of our operator here or the fixed point of our while loop that you, you know these things from, from programming, at least the computer scientists among you. And the result is A and B. So in German, I would say this is a Friede Freude Eierkuchen example. So everything is just smooth and the example is easy because, you know, C, well, there is no way to derive C. Everything is easy. This is a very easy example, but you saw at least how the mechanics works. Now let's look at a slightly more delicate example. So for this, let's add this rule C if B. This is actually a mean rule because look what happens, right? So intuitively, of course, we, you've seen this a lot. We have the fact A. Once we have A, we can derive B. And at that point, well, some of C is not derivable. And uh, so we get B and then, later, then afterwards we derive B, but now C is derivable, ouch. Okay, it's a mean example, but what it actually should illustrate is that at, when we apply this rule here uh, and we have no evidence of C, we make an assumption and we make the assumption that C is not derivable. And later on, C may actually be derivable and this will actually show in the end that this, this condition here is problematic because you only check the negative conditions with respect to what you have derived so far. Okay, let's not spoil things too much. Let's run the example. Okay. As usual, we start with the empty set. Our fact contributes uh, to it, nothing else. We get A. Then in the next iteration, we have A. Now, the second rule applies because we have A. 
and so c is not a part of x so this so this condition is satisfied because we have a and this condition condition is satisfied because we have not been able to derive c so far okay so b is also derived and we get a and b now in the next iteration we have a and b and uh, okay so as before actually we get a and we get b because you know a is a part of it c is not yet a part of it but now the third rule is applicable because now we have b and the, in the result we will have a b and c okay next iteration we have a b and c we enter and now things get interesting so for, well of course we will reproduce a because it's a fact it will, it will always be uh, inside and however the second rule is not applicable anymore right because we have a so this condition is satisfied because we have a here but uh, now we have c inside and hence this negative body literal sum of fails because this condition uh, does not hold any longer hence the rule is not applicable and we do not get uh, b so but here inside this x here we still have b so this rule is applicable hence we get a and c okay good ne next iteration we have a and c so let's see what we get with a and c if we have a and c well of course we get the fact we get a again since we have c this here this uh, condition doesn't doesn't hold also condition induced by this literal doesn't hold so there's this guy so we don't get b as well and now we also lost we also lost c because we don't have b so we only get a okay in our next iteration which will now be x5 we have only a i put this here and for the obvious reason because we are back to square one because from now on we have created a nice loop and our operator will loop a loop and loop until the stack divorces us as we say in computer science sometimes okay anyway you, you, you saw that actually checking a negative condition so because as i mentioned before you can read this condition actually as unless c has been derived but if we only check whether c has been derived with respect to what we had before this is insufficient because it may arrive later on now the question is when is it safe to say that c cannot be derived and this is not a pause just by cutting videos when is it safe to say that an atom cannot be derived well only at the end so only once you have seen everything that is derivable then uh, you can actually say that the atom is not derivable this really sounds like a circular thingy right because you want to derive things in the absence of information unless something is derivable but these atoms that are not derivable uh, can only be determined once you've seen everything well let's see actually what we can do to this end and yes the example has demonstrated that my naive attempt of fixing the procedure for computing the consequences of positive programs by simply adding this condition here for the negative body literals has failed. Nonetheless, I believe that it has taught us an interesting lesson. And the lesson is that checking the negative literals only with respect to what has been computed so far doesn't work. Because in the end we have to make sure that these atoms are not derivable at all and not just up to a certain point. The question now is, how can we fix this? And well, of course, a simple way is to say, okay, instead of taking here what we have computed so far, we take actually the result that we get. Well, I use simple, again, it may sound a bit naive, but I th actually, this is the way we go. So let's just assume that we had an oracle and the oracle would tell us this is the result and we only have to check it so what we do is we introduce something magnificent a guess so the guess here is y and it will hold more or less a candidate for the result of our computation now what we do with this y are two things first of all since it's the potential result of the procedure we evaluate all negative body literals with respect to the oracle's guess okay 
So more or less, if this turns out to be a solution, then we actually evaluate all negative body literals with respect to the result. Cool. Okay, then the rest happens more or less as before. All the rest is unchanged until here, where we don't simply return what we computed here, so we, the x that we have uh, obtained, but we check whether the x coincides with the guess by the oracle. And if this is, if this is the case, great. Then we have a solution. Uh, and we return it, and else, if they do not coincide, um, well, our procedure fails. And this is the obvious patch, actually, if an oracle gives you a potential solution. Let's test this with our examples. Okay, so let's start with our Friede Freude Eierkuchen example, or how I would say in English, peace, joy, and pancake example. Oh, oh, bad joke. Anyway, back to the example that will simply serve to us for explaining a bit the me mechanism. So if we now want to evaluate this example with our procedure, the lazy ones among us, like me, will actually note that the negative conditions here, like not C, can be evaluated once at the beginning. That is, once the oracle has given us a guess, this condition will stay the same through the whole procedure. Only X will actually change. So what we can actually do is at the beginning, once the oracle gives us um, such, a, such, a, such a guess of a Y, we can already check is C inside or not, and this will remain true like this until, until the pr pr procedure terminates. Okay, so what changes is we start with a guess. So let's again start by look, going through the possibilities. Here we start with the empty set. Let's assume uh, the empty set is a, is, a, is a stable model. So again, looking, looking at, it, at, at this, we see that C is not contained in Y. Hence, this condition is uh, satisfied and more or less the procedure can now run just as, as, as usual by concentrating on the positive part because this condition is satisfied for the only negative, negative literal because there's no negative literal. Things just run as we, as we did with positive logic problems. So here we go. We derive uh, A and B, but now actually we derived more than we begged for, right? So we, we got the empty set by the oracle or we assumed this as our final result, but we got A and B. So this is the result. It's unequal to, to Y, and this guy is not a solution. Okay, this is more or less what happens here now in this last rule. Now, next candidate, let's say A. And we know the drill, right? And keep in mind that uh, C is not inside here as well, so we can just proceed as, as we did. Again, we derive A and B. We even derive more than we backed for again. And this is also not a, not a stable model. And just to, 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 to give the honors to all candidates, right? B as well. So here we know already that the fact must be inside. That cannot be a, a solution. So this is also not a stable model. Okay, last but not least, A and B. What happens here? Again, note that C is not inside the uh, the, the candidate and um, and also it's not worth really adding C to the candidates because we could not derive it but anyway let's just finish this we derive everything from from the rules that remain and we get A and we get B and actually this is a stable model so we've already seen with this simple example a little bit how things work with this additional condition that relies on the initial solution candidate, we can pre-evaluate this condition and then more or less apply this operator as, uh, as before. And then only have to check the result with respect to what we guessed. Now let's look at our more complicated example, or the nasty one actually. Now recall that this example was nasty because it led our previous patch of, the, of, of our procedure into a cyclic behavior. And this is even visible when you look at the, at the program because B is true unless C is derivable and C is derivable if B is derivable. And of course, then we're back to square one again. Okay, now, as we've seen before, we more or less have to run through our guesses. And now actually we have three possibilities to derive atoms, A, B, and C. And theoretically, we now had to look at eight candidates, right? Because recall, before I didn't look at candidate sets 
with C because there was no rule giving it, right, in the previous Friede, Freude, Eierkuchen example. Okay, now back to this example, I zip my command thingy. Let's start by assuming that A is true, because this makes sense, because it's a fact, it must be true anyway, right? So we now um, see that, again, C is not contained in here, so this, the, con the condition induced by this negative body literal, which is this one, is already satisfied by, by this guess. So I will not look at this at each step. We just then derive things, launch our procedure, and in the end, oh, again, we got more than we begged for, because given that we have A, we can, um, we, we only have A, we can derive B, and since in the end we can derive B, we can also derive C. So, in fact, we, we, by assuming that only A holds, we got A, B, and C, and actually violated uh, this condition and the, hence we fail in that. Uh, we fail here and, and this will not terminate well for us. Okay, well, let's look at the second candidate, uh, A and B, which was uh, the, the only solution of the first two rules by themselves. Now again, uh, keep in mind that C is not, does not belong to our solution candidate, hence the corresponding condition is satisfied. And now we derive things, again we get A, B and C, again we derive C even though we, we started under the assumption that C is not true, so this is also not a stable model. Now, okay, since more or less we always produce more, let's, and we produce A, B and C, let's look at that and what happens here. Of course, at the beginning, um, oh, before I do that, wait, wait, wait. Oh. Because now a big change happened, right? Because now we start with the assumption that C will be derived in the end. And hence the condition induced by not C, this one, fails for this rule. So this rule is not applicable. And so somehow we already see, oh, then B cannot be derived, so there can also not be a solution. But well, one thing at, at the time, right? So we start with the empty set. Of course, the fact goes into our conclusions, no way around that. And now we have derived A, uh, but again, this condition cannot be satisfied, so the rule doesn't apply and we can't, uh, we can't uh, derive B. Since we don't have B, again, B depends only of what we derived so far and not on the result, right? So we cannot derive C and we only get A. And now we get actually much less than we put in now, so this is not uh, a stable model. So, interesting, in the sense that here we didn't actually run into, the, uh, into these loops and somehow, given this, this nasty cycle, there is actually no, 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 no stable model, right? So the example was a bit constructed in such, a, in such a nasty way. Nonetheless, I think it taught us interesting lessons and now the question is, can this idea, some of the idea of the pr that putting this in the procedure of starting with the guess uh, so the, and, and the guess on the final result, then checking the negative conditions with respect to this guess and seeing whether we could reproduce the guess and then if we could reproduce it, then it is a, it is a, it is a solution stable model as it fails. Can this be also generalized to a mathematical characterization or can it lead to that? Okay, before we do this, perhaps one other thing. Uh, when we looked at positive programs, right, we started from the empty set we applied the rules, applied the rules, and got the set of consequences, the smallest set of atoms that was close under the positive probe, right? So we start from nothing, we compute and get a single solution, because the positive program had a single set of consequences. Now actually here, if you want to implement this guess, right, if normally we don't have oracles around, so what would we do? We would write a, lo a, a loop that loops over all candidates. As, as I did with the examples, you would first take the empty set, try it, then take all sets with one element, try them, all sets with two elements, try them until you have exhausted more or less the set of all atoms that, that, are, that give you candidate sets. And which ones are that again? Just the subsets of the heads of the logic program, right? Uh, and, and then you would see, depending on the guess, which one can be reproduced, and this would give you the candidate. So you would all, what we already see is that we may get several stable models. And that's actually what makes sense. Keep in mind the example that I gave way back where the idea is 
what is the stable model semantics? You take a logic program, this specifies your, your problem, and then you associate a set of stable models with it. Because your problem may have alternative solutions, timetabling, right? You have a timetabling problem and each stable model corresponds to a, an alternative solution of it. Anyway, I zip it again and let's now answer this question. Now the question is, can this idea be used also for a mathematical characterization? And somehow I guess I've been hinting to this a little bit, because after all, once we have a solution candidate, right, so we, we, we guessed more or less the output of the procedure, we can actually, well, pre-evaluate this condition here. Because y will not change during the iteration. Um, and we can do this right up front and then only concentrate on building up x. Okay, Once, one thing at the time. Let's just collect these ideas a little bit. Now the first idea, of course, is to guess the result. And, well, since we don't have an oracle at hand normally, y will more or less serve as, a, as, as an argument, as a parameter of a characterization. And the next thing is, of course, that, we, that with this y, once we have it, we can pre-evaluate the negative bodies and with them actually uh, some of the rules. So if we know that a rule does not satisfy this condition, we can kick it out. On the other hand, if we know that a rule satisfies this condition, we've evaluated the negative body and we don't have to care about it anymore. Okay, let's make this precise. So the idea is, once we have a, a potential solution candidate Y, we can pre-evaluate the negative body literals or the negative body of each rule with respect to Y. Okay, so we more or less pre-evaluate this. And depending on the outcome of this condition, we can simplify our program. Now, the first thing is, if there is an atom in the negative body that belongs to the result, well then this the, 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 the negative literal is false and the condition is not satisfied, right? So we want to have a con something that unless C in the example, but we have C in the, in the potential result that can't work, we drop the rule. Okay, on the other hand, if none of the atoms in the negative uh, body uh, are in I and Y, right? If they are if they are completely disjoint, then we have already pre-evaluated the negative body, and we only have to bother about the positive one. So we can replace the whole body with the positive atoms. We more or less drop all the negative body literals from R. Now the interesting thing is that what by this second by this second condition, all the remaining rules are now positive. And now we're on home ground. Now we can apply more or less what we applied, uh, what we applied before, just by looking at positive programs. And the last idea is then is okay. Then we 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 take the consequence operator. So if p prime is the program obtained after this uh, after this uh, manipulation here, after this simplification actually, because it's a positive program, then we can simply compute the consequences of p prime and check whether these consequences equal our original guess. Again, this is now more or less taking this procedural idea and distilling things, distilling the ideas out of it. And this will be now the building blocks of our real characterization of the stable models. And one of the key factors is how can we actually characterize the simplifications of a program with respect to a guess? And this will be the famous reduct, that is the core of the reduct-based characterization. So I think now I watered your brains, so let's, let's check this out.